the book of Philemon tonight. Philemon is wedged in between Titus and Hebrews. And we'll start at verse 9. Philemon 1, verse 9. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, <clears throat> whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again. Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own vows, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for everyone that's here. Bless, Lord, the truth we're about to look at. Make it real. and Make it, um, Lord, such that it'll it'll fit our life where we are today. It'll help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. In verse 13, Paul said, um, whom I would have retained with me. Paul said to um, Philemon, he said, I'm, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. And he said, really, he said, I, I would have liked to have kept him. But he said, but without your permission, he said, I wouldn't do that. He said, I would have retained him with me. Um, Onesimus was worth keeping. You know, I'm sure there's some people that that uh, could have showed up at, at Paul's prison cell or whatever. And 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 uh, it really wouldn't have been a big deal to Paul one way or the other if they stayed or didn't stay. But man, a real friendship had developed, and especially because he had uh, led Onesimus to Jesus Christ. Um, Onesimus was worth keeping. He would save, I mean, excuse me, he would serve. He would stay. He would help. He would relieve Paul. He would run errands for Paul. But he would do all this on the dark side of the gospel. Now, when I say that, um, you know, I know that this is the message that we have heard of him, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. When I say that, I, I realize um, there's no there's no darkness on the on uh, in the sense that we often think of it. There's there's nothing underhanded. There's nothing crooked. There's nothing that, that has to be covered up. Uh, there's nothing like that. But. But he said one of the reasons that he was so impressed with Onesimus was. He said, I have begotten him in my bonds. Look at the end of verse 13. It says that he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. You know, when um, Paul came across Onesimus, um, Paul was in bonds. He was in disgrace. He was in isolation. He was a prisoner. Um, and Paul was impressed with him because uh Onesimus knew that Paul was in prison for the gospel's sake. Paul was not in prison because, you know, he had done something crooked. Um, uh, Paul was in prison for the gospel's sake. And, you know, there is a side to the gospel that um, has some bonds to it. There was a side of the gospel that wasn't always bright and wonderful. Man, there, there's some bright things. There's some blessings. Um, there's some huge blessings. It says the Lord daily loadeth us with benefits. So much of our life is really like the children of Israel in the wilderness. I mean, manna fell day by day by day and quail came and, and their shoes didn't wear old and God just kept them going in those 40 years of the wilderness. And, um, and you know, for us as believers, uh, the Lord is our keeper. The Lord is our shade. Upon our right hand, the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. Man, he just blesses us left, right, and center. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. And forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. 
who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, and crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. Man, there's some blessings in this thing. There's some blessings. And, um, but there is another side to this. There's another side to this. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. 2 Corinthians 11. Paul said, I would have retained him. He said he was worth keeping because he wasn't just in it for the blessings. He would minister to me in the bonds. The bonds were the chains. He said he would minister to me in the bonds of the gospel. The dark side. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23, and Paul gives a, a brief history of a lot of the things he'd been through. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? These people in Corinth that were trying to undermine him. Are they ministers of Christ? Paul said, I speak as a fool. He said, what I'm about to say. He said, I am more. He said, man, if they're a minister of Christ, I sure am. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, I didn't mean on his clothes either. I mean on his back. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft there were many times Paul thought he was going to lose his life. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. And what that means is, under the law, the maximum penalty that they could whip someone with a bull whip was um, they could give them 40 stripes. But they always stopped at 39 just in case they had miscounted. Paul, can you imagine? We're doing this thing on, you know, um, children in the family and all that. And I'm always very careful on the camera. I try to be. And um, I talk about how my dad gave me shock treatments, you know. And um, and I thought that was comical. And my wife said, honey, there's people out there that are really going to think he was taking electrodes and shocking you. <laughs> no, I was getting a different kind of shock treatments. <laughs> you know, where the Board of Education is applied to the seat of learning. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, I was talking to one of the other guys. I can't remember who it was. And we were comparing our shock treatment experiences. This generation is jaded. They do not understand. They're so soft. It's just unbelievable. It's no wonder our forefathers won wars. I don't know about this generation. <laughs> I, I made the statement that one evening. I said, you know what? Back in those days, when you were pushing the grocery cart through the store, if you started screaming and wailing, if, you're, if your mom didn't smack you, the guy in the next cart over would smack you. <laughs> but boy, those days are gone. Those days are gone. And... Um, Man, there was more than once we were, again, we were talking about this the other night, and this guy said it unsolicited, and it, and it made me smile. I remember on more than one occasion getting in the tub, and there was visible evidence. You know, they go, <gasps> you haven't read your Bible, have you? I would encourage you to read the book of Proverbs. I know there's things that are over the top. I, I get that. I, I, I know there is that side of things. But you know, the worst that we ever got was if we if we pushed mom to the edge of what little sanity she had. And, you know, she wailed on us. She never came close to 39 stripes. The 10 or 15 we got were well-deserved. They were well-deserved. But 39... And you know, we always got it right down here. And this God built this section of your body. It's got extra cushioning. 
Good nerve endings, but extra cushion. <laughs> and um, um, you know what? When they when they gave those guys when they gave those guys stripes, it wasn't a middle aged woman who was just frustrated because she was rightly frustrated with you. And on top of that, she was having a bad day anyway. So you got both barrels. It wasn't a middle aged woman. It wasn't a middle aged woman. And and it wasn't somebody swinging a belt about this long, maybe, or a paddle. It was a full-blown bruiser, full-blown bruiser, in tip-top condition, 250 pounds of pure muscle, wielding a bull whip. Uh, just tell me how you've suffered for Jesus. Tell me. We've had it so easy, it's un. Believable. And Paul said, can you imagine just once, just once surviving 39 lashes with a bull whip? Paul's back would have been pure hamburger. Oh, yeah. Paul said, I went through that. At, at the time of this writing, Paul said, I've endured that five times. Can you imagine? I, can you imagine on about the fourth time you're going, oh, dear Lord, again? We're talking about the bonds of the gospel. Let's read it. Verse 24. Of the Jews, five times, verse 24, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-four. 24. Of the Jews, five times, Received I 40 stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. So that's on top of that. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often in perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils by mine own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh on me daily, the care of all the churches. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. Paul said, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me. And there are many adversaries, not a few. Also, I got a lot of people, they are dedicated to hindering everything I'm trying to do. He told the folks in 2 Thessalonians, he said, pray for us that we might be delivered from wicked and unreasonable Men, look at Second Timothy chapter one. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And you got the Thessalonians, then you got First and Second Timothy. Look at Second Timothy chapter one. Second Timothy one. 2 Timothy 1, verse 8. He writes to Timothy, who's a young man, and he says, Be not thou therefore ashamed. You know why he loved Onesimus? Onesimus just kept coming back to that prison cell. He just kept coming back. That was a shameful place. He just kept coming back. Verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. He talked about the bonds of the gospel. You know, sometimes, uh, and we talked about it this morning, we talked about the, being in the storm and neither sun nor moon in many stars 
in many, many days appeared. Um, and you know, um, there, um, boy, sometimes there, there is a, it seems like sometimes there's a, there's a dark side to this, you know, in heaven, it's, it's, it's bright and light and joyful forever, but we're not there yet. And we're, we're in a world where there is a real warfare going on and Satan is the God of this world. And, um, man, there's, there's times where you'll, you'll find yourself in a dark place for having lived for Jesus. Um, it's interesting, uh, in the book of Job, Job in his trouble several, several times, he makes mention to the darkness that he was in. In Exodus 20, the Lord is on Mount Sinai and the mountain is on fire. And, um, and the people are down at the base of the mount and they're hearing the voice of God and it's exceeding loud. And God tells them, get back away from the base of the mount. And um, Moses went up into the mount to get the Ten Commandments, those two tables of stone. And it says, and Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Look at 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings 8, uh, Solomon is praying at the dedication of the temple. And in 1 Kings 8, First Kings 8, verse 10. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. In Psalm 18, David said he made darkness his secret place. You know, uh, sometimes there is, a, there is a side to this, you know, um, where it, it can get um, it can get dark sometimes. It can get very difficult. Uh, it can get very confusing. It can get uh, man just just troublesome to find your way. But that doesn't mean that the Lord isn't there. He said, "You know," I said, uh, Philemon. He said, "I appreciate Onesimus because you know he's not getting much out of this." I gave, well, he got a lot out of it. He got salvation. He said, I, he said, but I, I, I haven't fed him. He said, I, he's bringing food to me. I said, I, I can't pay him. I can't do anything for him. And he keeps coming back and he wants to learn more. And he sees me, I re this, if I am the only representative that he sees of the gospel, here I am in chains. And he said, he's worth keeping. He's Philemon. Philemon, I'm going to send him back. He's worth keeping. The bonds of the gospel. Look at Deuteronomy 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6. Bonds. What an interesting word. The bonds of the gospel. It's interesting. Paul didn't say the bonds of the prison. He said the bonds of the gospel. Look at Deuteronomy 6. Verse 21. Verse 20. And when thy son, Deuteronomy 6.20, and when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Man, you see that word, uh, Egypt was called the house of bondage. Um, you see the word bound. You see 
uh, the word bind. Uh, look at look at verse eight of this same chapter. Uh, I guess you'd need to go back to verse six. Verse six. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. You know, um, the this thing of the Lord and his words and following the Lord Jesus, you know, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed, and there's great freedom in Jesus Christ. And yet, there's something about it that um, you know we we do we do have a new master. Uh, our old master, you know, would would have used us and destroyed us, and he didn't care about us, and and uh, you know, and it was going to all end in a place called hell. And we 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 turned from him, and we embraced a new master. And the new master loves us, and the new master's got a, a mansion waiting for us, and and he's a good master. But there's something binding the bonds of the gospel. There's something the Lord intended it would there'd be something about it that was binding. You know, for ye are dead to the law that ye might be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead. Uh, you know what marriage is, at, at least as God intended it, it is it is binding. It is binding. I realize things happen, tragedies happen, but, but you understand what I'm saying? You know, this guy meets this gal and they get married. And, um, and you know, when they were single, they could sort of do anything they wanted and each of them could do their own thing and, and their time was their own. But all of a sudden there comes a day at a marriage altar where they make vows to God and vows are binding. God says, if you bind your soul with an oath, it's binding. Look at, you're in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at verse 18. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. Verse 17. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he had commanded thee. You know, it struck me in verse 18 there, thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. In the sight of the Lord. I remember calling a, a friend of mine and uh, she worked as a psych nurse. And she's a believer. She's a really sweet gal. Uh, really loves the Lord. And... Um, she was a psychiatric nurse. And I was asking her, I said, um, how do I know the difference between um, somebody that is um, being uh, nasty and hateful and abusive? Uh, I said, how do I know when that's a mental issue and when it's willful? And she said, can they control it? She said, do they act normal when everybody else is around? I said, yes. She said, then it's not totally psychotic. You know, the person that can mind their P's and Q's in the sight of the church people, you know, th that really doesn't say much. The real test is, and, and eternity will reveal it, and the judgment seat of Christ is all about what you and I were in the sight of of the Lord. When nobody else was around. In those private moments in the darkness behind the closed doors. That's where real Christianity lives. If it's binding. It's binding at all times. David said, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud as any time of the day or night. At midnight, he said, I will arise and praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Who's around at midnight? Maybe your wife, she's laying there beside you, but you know, you know, we're not sleeping in communes around here. 
You know, you know, that's a very private midnight is a pretty private time. And David said, you can you can check me out any hour of the day. He said, I'm concerned about the sight of the Lord. David said, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. In Romans 2, it talks about the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 4, it says about that day, he will bring to light the hidden things. The hidden things. The bonds of the gospel. You know, the bonds. You know, you know what that, that bond is? It was a restraint imposed. It was a limitation you know what? You know what those bonds were a picture of? It, it limited his freedom. Anybody, any prisoner that you see that's uh, in shackles, you know, uh, you know what it does? It just, it just, it limits their ability, limits their movement, limits their mobility. Look at Romans fourteen with me. Romans fourteen, verse eleven. For it is written. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But and he's talking about material things, and and in the context here, he's going to be talking about uh, uh, some meat that was offered to idols. Okay, um, he says, "I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably." In other words, he said, "You're you're really not concerned about him. You're just concerned about you." He says, "If if this thing you're doing." Um, and, and by the way, he's not saying the sky's the limit and you can do anything you want. And, and, you know, that's not what he's saying here. He's talking about there were there were some inanimate things, some material things that really were nothing in themselves. A, a chunk of meat is a chunk of meat and it could be laid in front of, you know, an idol. And, and Paul said, we know that that idol is literally nothing. It's a chunk of wood. But he said, but it's a different matter. He said, if you're your brother sees you eat that, and to eat that was to make a statement that you were a, a partaker of that. He said, you and I both know that's a piece of meat, but you you got a, a weak brother that just came out of that, just got saved out of that idol worship, and they've renounced it, and they've renounced all the wickedness that came with it. And he said, and, and, and suddenly they see you grab a piece of that meat, and he said, they're, they're going to draw the wrong message from that. And he says, if they wind up back in that idolatry, and that idolatry was not just about meat. It was about temple prostitution. There was a whole pile of stuff that went with that worship in Corinth. He said, uh, he said if, if they go back into that, he said, that's your fault. He said, you made them stumble. And that's what he's warning them about here. Verse 15, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. It seems crazy, doesn't it? Couldn't you just forego a piece of meat? And yet how many times do Christians, they, they don't want anybody else restraining their liberty. Well, well, preacher, there, there's not a verse about that. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. Okay, but what kind of message are you sending out? What about the little girl at church that's going to follow your example? What about the little boy at church that's been looking up to you and, and they heard you say that? They heard you, they saw you go there. What about that? It's interesting the wording. God says, don't destroy somebody else just because you're just going to have your own way. Verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the works of God. All things indeed are pure, 
but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And it slides right on into chapter 15. We then that are weak, excuse me, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for he is good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all. You know what they called those servants? They called them bond servants. Bond servants. You know, Paul just said there, Paul said, he said, I am no man's slave. Paul said, I, I, Paul was a free Roman citizen. He was a Jew, but he was a free Roman citizen. He said, you know, he said, I, I don't, I don't need to bow down and kiss anybody's boots. He said, I don't need to do that. But he said, but for the gospel, verse 19, for though I be free from all men, Yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law. Now he throws in a little clause there because what he's referring to there is the Gentiles. Okay. And he says being not without law to God. He said, he said I'm not talking about being lawless and, and wicked. He said not without law to God but under the law to Christ that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that by all means, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake. Verse 24. You know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run, run in this way that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery, for that ultimate reward, is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. He's talking about those, those athletes. He said they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. Paul says, I know exactly what I'm doing. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Boy, have you ever observed an athlete? Some of you have done some reading, you know, and, and the, the further those guys go, uh, you know, you get those guys that start moving towards world titles. You get those guys that are moving towards athletic competition. And this is a reference toward the Roman games. Paul often alluded to athletes in his writings because of their discipline. He said, you know, have you ever noticed how those that strive for the mastery are temperate in all things? Man, I remember being in high school. I remember the track, the track runners and, you know, these various guys. And they'd be talking about, man, the coaches told us, you know, for the next six weeks, we're not allowed. We're not supposed to be drinking pop. We're not supposed to be eating pie and cake and ice cream. Can you imagine that telling that to a 16-year-old boy? I mean, that's like serious torture. Uh, you, you, you know, the, the whole thought was, um, um, you know, that moderation, you're, you know, like drinking pop. You say, what in the world is drinking pop? Well, if you're a track runner, there's something about the carbon dioxide. That's the stuff that makes you burp, you know. There, there's something about that carbonation. It affects your wind. I knew a guy that held a world title in uh, in the martial arts long before, you know, this whole um, UFC thing was a thing. This was back in the days before it resembled the barbarians in the Coliseum. 
And this, this was back in the day when they would fight a title, but nobody was looking to see blood or broken bones. You know, we, we've really pro progressed down a dark road. You know, and, and if you like watching that stuff, I'm just going to tell you right up front, um, I love you, but there's something wrong. I had a friend, preacher friend, older gentleman. He said, you know, he said, he said, I got saved out of the biker gangs. And he said, I remember breaking people's bones. He said, I remember watching people's blood flow. And he said, it was awful then, and it's awful now. And he went off talking about the whole UFC thing. He said, why you want to watch somebody else's bones get broken? He said, you got something messed up in your head. Amen. But this guy held a world title. He said when he was training for that world title, one of the things they did was they, they had them running uh, for every round they were going to fight, they had to be able to run a mile to match it. He said, so if we were running a 10-round fight or a 15-round fight, if that's what we were training for, he said, one of the things we had to do, we had to run 10 miles or 15 miles every, every day. You know what you call that? You call that dedication. And Paul holds that up in front of you and me and says, now you know what they do. He said, and they do it to win a stupid piece of metal around their neck. That, that someday they're going to throw in a drawer and nobody's going to ever remember. He said, they do it for that. And Paul said, Paul said, you know, he said, I take my cue from that. Paul said, I keep under my body. He said, if there's anything that's going to put me out of this race, he said, it's my body. It's going to be the lust of my flesh. Or maybe I'll just indulge myself. One guy said that uh, a, lot of, a lot of Christian men, by the time they're 50, they've killed themselves with their fork. Paul said, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. Why? Because he said, I don't ever want to be a castaway. He said, I want God to use me as long as he can possibly use me. You know what you call that? Paul said, I do this for the gospel's sake. Paul said, Philemon, you can keep Onesimus. He said, really, I want to keep him. He's worth keeping. Because he will deny himself for the gospel's sake. What did Jesus say? He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, I don't know what that looks like for you. Um, but you know what will happen is every once in a while, something will come up in your life. And you know what our life is filled with? It's, it's filled with choices. It's filled with choices. And um, you know what our life is supposed to be about? in one way or another. I mean, here we are tonight. You know what brought us into this room tonight? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Somewhere back there, you heard about how Jesus died for your sins and you opened your heart. The gospel is why you're sitting here tonight. And again, Paul is why you're sitting here tonight. He was willing to deny himself so that other people would know about Jesus Christ. And, you know, our life, we, we've got a lot of things about our life, man. We, there's a lot of good things and fun things, and God has given us richly all things to enjoy. But, you know, there's a day coming when our life will be measured. And um, I wonder how much of our life as believers, and I, I, I'm talking to myself. I wonder how much of our life will have really counted for the gospel doesn't mean you got to witness every minute of the day but it does mean you got to guard your testimony of every minute of the day it does mean you're bringing your thoughts into captivity it does mean that you're living for the gospel in your private moments because your usefulness in the public moments depends on what god sees in the private. god's not in the business of you playing a hypocrite you know sometimes just that whole thing of that preparation for the gospel, that preparation for that moment when you'll share the gospel with somebody is you will have went through the darkness. You will have went through a storm. And maybe it was a private storm. I think a lot of people in this room, a lot of the storms you go through, a lot of your darkness, it's very private. 
But but you know what? If you're walking with the Lord there, if you were if you're gonna walk with God in the brightness and in the darkness, then your life's gonna count for the gospel. How much of our life? The bonds of the gospel. Just make sure, you know, we, we make fun of the, the health, wealth, and prosperity crowd, and rightly so. Because they just say everything should be wonderful all the time. Well, we just read this morning, it, it, it's, it's not wonderful all the time. And then you got you got some of the this real modern Christianity, and, and they just reject everything that's that's not comfortable. It's not cozy. That's why they've got to have the lights just perfect and they've got to have the music playing and the so the south wind blowing softly. Um, just make sure that for you and me, that the Lord looks down at us and we're we're worth keeping. I mean, he's gonna keep us anyway, right? He's gonna keep us till the day of redemption. But you know what? You you want the Lord to look down at you and me and go, He knows we're per imperfect. He knows our weaknesses. He knows we are dust. But he looks down and he sees you and me. And he says, you know what? They're trying, they're trying to stay true to me all the time. They're trying to get the gospel out. They're enduring the darkness, even the, even the unpleasant things. And they still love me. Don't 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 reach that point where in your life where you're just you know God's on trial and and you're just you're going to reject the darkness. No. God said I dwell in the darkness. And in some of those dark times if you'll just draw near you'll find him there. The bonds of the gospel. There's a bright side and there's a dark side. But Paul said, I'm taking it all. I close with this statement. Philemon had embraced the dark side of the gospel. He saw where the gospel had landed Paul. Where had the gospel landed Paul? In prison. He saw it. And you know what he said to himself? Oh, no. Oh, Onesimus had just gotten saved. And Onesimus said, you know what? Jesus Christ is worth this. He is worth it. He's looking at Paul and Paul's, going, Paul's in prison and I got saved and I got peace in my heart and I got a brand new life. Hey, it, it's worth it. Jesus Christ is worth whichever side of the equation I'm going to be on. He said, Jesus Christ is worth it. Let's pray. Jesus Christ is worth everything, even bonds. Lord, bless your truth. Lord, you bless us so many ways and you bless us daily. Lord, help us that we would take everything as from your hand. And Lord, we would serve you both in the brightness, Lord, and in the darkness. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if God has spoken to you tonight, why don't you talk to him?
Lord, thank you for your truth. Bless it to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.